The Zvinsky Stories presents Moral Lessons from the Legend of Korra's Villains. One of my favorite moments in Season 4 of The Legend of Korra is when Toph urges Korra to consider the goals of all her past villains. She's in a lowly state. A vicious attack with a terrible poison has rendered Korra physically and mentally incapable of standing up to her fourth and final nemesis in the series. In order to defeat the dictator Kuvira, the self-proclaimed emperor of the Earth Kingdom, she must develop an understanding of what makes that dictator tick. And so, she quickly chronicles all of the show's complex layered antagonists with Toph's help. In this project, I'm going to dive into what each villain's general aims were. What they each wanted to achieve started as something pure and was then corrupted into something terrible due to their imbalances. As a hero, Korra tried to correct the extremes in each instance and made recognizable but digestible change in the fast-evolving society around her. Part 1. Amon This mass saboteur may actually be the simplest nut to crack. He led a band of gang members known as the Equalists, after all, and in his quest to rid the world of benders, he stayed true to the notion that a world with only regular people would be the most even playing field. A desire this fervent came from trauma. Understanding the injustices his waterbender crime lord of a father forced on him and his brother, he denounces the waterbender ways, even if he can never become what he wishes everyone to be, a non-bender. Instead, he'll pretend not to be one to the masses. Amon lies and says that the spirits have bestowed upon him a power to take a person's bending away, but in the grand scheme, Amon is a supremely ironic villain. He can only further his goals because of the waterbending talent he possesses. In his arrogance, he's a perversion of the very idea of true equality, and takes certain people's freedoms and choices away from them in a world that he, and he alone, deems equal. Another irony of his ultimate goal is that equality is happening in the world of the Legend of Korra. Sure, it's happening more slowly than Amon wants, but there honestly isn't much for Korra to correct once Amon is gone. We see technology continue to develop naturally throughout the rest of the show. Machinery and electricity allow non-benders to become serious forces to be reckoned with. Kuvira doesn't lead an army of earthbenders. She leads legions of mechs that can incapacitate all but the most powerful of benders. Entire segments of the population don't need their identity forcibly removed for equality to thrive. Those differences can be celebrated, but Amon's virtue as a villain remains because we know how much worse his father was. We understand that the children of an evil man are stuck in a vicious, self-serving cycle of extreme ideals and an emphasis on power. Both benders and non-benders have the abilities to make the world a better or worse place in The Legend of Korra. Amon is right in saying that all past wars on this planet had been instigated and waged by benders. But now in this golden age, people like Varric and the Sato family have just as much influence to make the world a stronger or darker place to live. Without even realizing it, Amon's vision of equality partly comes to pass in this legend. Part 2. Unalak Korra's motifs of technological advancement and cultural appropriation give rise to a new antagonist, one who is concerned with the waning connection to the spirits in the South Pole. It's at first a highly relatable notion. It's cut from the same cloth of how elders in the real world chastise our constant use of smartphones or our erratic attention on a variety of different issues of wavering importance. Unalak wants people to listen to his plea. But a couple episodes into Season 2, we understand how not to ask people to listen. Unalak is often pinned by viewers as the weakest villain in the show, and while he may be the least compelling or least sympathetic, I think he does an admirable job of fulfilling his villainous goals. He's a force to be reckoned with, and always feels like he's one step ahead of the Avatar until the very end of the season. He expertly weaves force and deception together to paint a picture of a man trying to unite his people. He's a populist at his best, and a corrupt warmonger at worst. He becomes infatuated with the dark spirit Vatu, and seeks to merge with him, overcorrecting an imbalance he perceives as when Rava merged with Juan 10,000 years prior. Giving Unalak the benefit of the doubt, he's not exactly wrong from a philosophical, balanced point of view, 
especially considering that humans have no recorded history of what a dark age would really be like. We know what 10,000 years of having a light avatar was like, and unfortunately that still included large periods of war, famine, and the fragmentation of society. Sure, Unalak seems unfazed with the peril and destruction of others around him, but taken in a holistic, global approach, Unalak wants to try something new. He's willing to plunge the world into a dark chaos because he feels it's the planet's natural, rightful state. He loses sight of spiritual balance, however, as Korra shows her virtue by not controlling the spirits around her. Any natural state cannot include an alpha exerting total control on everything else. There's supposed to be an ebb and flow, push and pull, in any natural environment, and Korra puts herself in that middle. Korra decides to take on the impossible job of mediator. She's essentially a warden of yin and yang. She will try hard to balance the needs of humans and spirits. She does heed her uncle's advice to an extent by leaving the portals open and allowing the two types of creatures to coexist, but she doesn't seek to control them either. This is a more difficult kind of connection to maintain, but the beauty the spirits bring with them into the world seems to say the pursuit of such a connection is worth it. Part 3. Zaheer I find Zaheer to be the most compelling villain in The Legend of Korra because his way of thinking actually seems to be the most stable. Past traumas or pursuits of power don't distract him from his present course. From the beginning of his story off-screen before Korra's birth until the moment he is defeated by the New Air Nation, he is wholly dedicated to the creation of anarchy. Somewhat similar to Unalak, and appropriately so as they were both founding members of the Red Lotus, Zaheer wants to achieve pure freedom. Unlike Unalak, however, Zaheer isn't concerned with a reign of darkness, but he does want to end the reign of the Avatar. Whether Korra was aligned with the light or the dark is irrelevant. He views both political leaders and spiritual leaders as corrupt vessels that, by their very nature, control the fates of others to unfortunate ends. Korra may have everyone's best interests at heart, but it's impossible to conclude that she doesn't force change on all the world's people at the same time. Her decision to keep the portals open is proof of that, but even if she had kept the portals closed, Zaheer would still view her as a problem. Either way, it would have been a world-altering decision. Zaheer is not political. He doesn't agree or disagree with the minutia of what's going on in the world or how exactly it is governed. Rather, he just doesn't believe it should be governed at all. When we see less morally righteous leaders, such as Republic City's president and the Earth Queen, continuously shroud their peoples in ignorance, we can't help but sympathize with Zaheer's heart. We may not agree that a complete lack of government is ideal, but we do understand that the foundations society is built on in this world might need to be torn down for something new to flourish. The most interesting thing about Zaheer's story is that some of the things he accomplishes can actually be considered for the greater good. The assassination of the Earth Queen effectively ends the enslavement and conscription of her citizens. His philosophy of allowing people to choose their own path, regardless of worldly attachments, gifts him the sacred ability of flight. He's also the only villain of Korra's that will actually help mentor her later in the show. He's got a righteous heart, in a way, and a good head on his shoulders to achieve his aims. His most obvious imbalance is his complete inability to understand another's point of view. Korra tries to convince him that full-on anarchy is not the way, but every time, he shrugs her off as a child who knows no better. Slowly throughout the season, Korra actually adopts a more moderate Zaheer style. She eventually comes to terms with the fact that the Air Nation cannot be rebuilt through obligation. It must be reforged through people's selfless choices to join a culture and community they know nothing about. Through Korra's patient understanding and belief in her friends, that they will lead an elective, affirmative air nation, she brings back a dying culture. There's no coercion to make the world a better place, and there's certainly less force exerted on those least expecting it. And even Zaheer will see the error of his ways when he comes to realize his lack of control over the situation in the Earth Kingdom led to an arguably even worse dictator taking hold. Part 4. Kuvira if Zaheer wanted free will to reign absolutely, Kuvira wants the exact opposite. It's not a necessity. She needs to exert control over the entire Earth Kingdom for very specific reasons. 
She values tradition and providing the basic necessities to all people equally. She is a sort of amalgamation of the series' past villains, and like Korra, she intends to push through all obstacles in her path in order to accomplish her vision. Thusly, she lacks the foresight to understand what she's doing is wrong. Taking control isn't the answer to all problems, especially when the citizens Kuvira conquers become less and less enthused by the aid she promises to provide. She's a clever manipulator, however, so much so that even Varric and Bolin see her crusade as a positive thing in the absence of the world's avatar. Kuvira has as much hubris as Korra's other antagonists. She sees no other end in sight for the world other than her own control. And when her desires to dominate are tested, she goes to the extreme lengths of harvesting spiritual energy as a weapon against Republic City. She forces equality like Amon, perverts the spiritual energy of the world like Unalak, and seeks to bend the world to her ideal vision like Zaheer. Yet somehow she is understandable. The world in the three-year pause between Korra's rise and fall is an unstable place. Poverty, chaos, and instability reign without a strong leader, and the current heir to the Earth Kingdom throne proves to be too immature and narrow-sighted to affect any real positive change. Kuvira at least has the drive to improve the world around her, but she lacks the humility to see that others around her, like the Metal Clan and the Air Nation, also have strong visions for a world united by service, equal treatment, and the pursuit of something higher. For the majority of the show, Korra also lacks this humility. She's a strong avatar, who changes the world time and time again. She grows to find inner balance, wisdom, and real compassion for all people. But it's only when she's brought down to her lowest point that Korra is able to see that she isn't the answer to all the world's problems. It will take the teamwork of many bright minds, and not the will of one driven empress or avatar, to continue to make the world a better place. Korra begins to live by this mantra not just by saving innocent people in the season 4 finale, but also by taking a step back after the final episode's credits roll. In the graphic novel Turf Wars, she sees firsthand that she's not the one answer anymore. Zhu Li becomes Republic City's president. Asami is instrumental in defending the fragile infrastructure of Republic City, and both Mako and Bolin strive to clean up the streets, now newly teeming with chaos after the Day of the Colossus. Korra learns through fighting all of her villains that finding balance in life is key. In a lot of ways, that means moderation, intently listening to both sides and coming to a sometimes painful compromise. Korra listens to past tradition and combines it with the modern, radical sentiments of her villains. It's a supremely hopeful show in a way, because I can think of no other high fantasy series that so clearly paints a picture of a world in turmoil that ends up having genuine, realistic potential to become the best version of itself. Korra is an amazing heroine to create such a positive outlook along with her friends, but she is also wise enough to realize that some of her greatest ideas come from recognizing the humanity in her own enemy's greatest goals.